Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think of how that would be. That would be imagined. I mean, from this from this book, uh, I guess it didn't deal with that question, but I got the impression that it, essentially it was like production is almost centrally planned in a way that, but basically by like the Industrial Federation, for example. So the question of like particular unions like opting out, you know, if it's maybe not in their self-interest to do so, um, yeah, I don't know exactly how that would be dealt with, but it's, it's just not the party at the top making decisions that are, are passed down because of the fact that there's like democratic participation from the ground up by all the unions who then elect delegates to each of these industrial uh, federations and so forth. And then those industrial federations are again making decisions about like, hey, let's take the bigger picture into account and how much needs to be produced, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if the answer is well, probably not, but well, I don't have a great answer. Well, there's an interesting dynamic uh, that we have, which is you'll notice that there's there's a federation of, for example, banks. Uh, U.S. Bank owns a bunch of subsidiary regional banks. Those regional banks own a bunch of subsidiary uh, local banks. And you can take the entire banking industry, and it's about six. We'll, we'll, I mean, they're obviously, they're, the, the technical term is corporations, right? They're incorporated. Um, but another term, theoretical, although not technical term, yeah, for incorporation would be federation. So for any given in, uh, industry that we have, um, basically uh, automotive, food, banking, uh, computers, video games, movies, you basically have six or seven federations that control or plan, centrally plan, um, economic production. And what you'll notice is at any given consumer level, anyone can choose not to buy any product from any of these or use any services of any of these given corporations. Um, any given worker can choose not to work for any of these um, corporations. Any given bank can choose, uh, with, with some gray area, can choose not to, um, to be incorporated or be taken over by these and can be privately held or collectively held. Um, so why how, how then, if at any given point, any given person can in principle opt out, um, how does that make it fundamentally different from anarcho-syndicalism, except that you don't have a state present to ensure, ensure property? Uh, well, again, I mean, corporations now are not worker-controlled. They're for-profit. Whatever is produced is kept by a small number of people and it's clearly not redistributed. Um, so again, I don't have a good answer for in terms of like how, um, I don't know, even under an anarcho-syndicalist system, you know, maybe individual workers, and certainly they could opt out, they don't have to like work uh, in that particular company or industry or whatever. But if the unions are what control industry through, again, creating federations and electing people, to then manage those um, those organizations, there's not a way for one of them to just say like, oh hey, you know, from now on, all the money from you know this collective of banks is now going into my pocket. Um, it has to be basically democratically decided. So, what would be in the interest of like all the workers that belong to that particular union would would be what would be the outcome because it's democratically run. That would be my guess. Um, so let's presuppose an imaginary union um, in an anarcho-syndicalist country. And this country is desperately poor, um, except they have a natural resource, let's say oil. And this, it's a completely democratically run, it's a very strong democratic union um, that is looking out for its own collective interests. And this union decides, uh, hey, you know what? Um, it's in our best collective interest to, because we are the, the union that uh, runs the, the refineries, that runs um, the extraction, that runs the transportation, um, that we should take in all the products of our society so that the union that or individuals that farm, the individuals that make jewelry, the individuals that make TV, um, they should give us all of that stuff for a very small price with almost no trade on our part because it's a desperately poor country. We control the one resource that matters 
And all of you in this country should basically, we have democratically decided as a union that we're going to strangle the rest of you, economically speaking, unless you give us everything you want, or everything we want. I mean, that's not ruled out by anarcho-syndicalism, is it? Talking about uh, Venezuela? Yeah, I mean, this is exactly <laughs> what happened with Venezuela with the oil company um, before Hugo Chavez came in and, you know, um, basically uh, broke up, and it sounds really terrible, given that we're an American experience, um, but actually broke up this union that was using the Venezuelan state oil company to strangle the rest of Venezuelan society and to keep excesses of profits for itself. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I don't have an answer to that. Well, I mean, essentially, would the would not the uh, the federation would be composed of all unions within that country, right? And so each union would have would probably have a vote, uh, probably just one vote or something along those lines, as opposed to like giving more votes to uh, one particular industry. So this. I mean, like, I guess in a, in a sense that's a bit of like centralized authority, but essentially the Federation could prevent that one union from doing that. Yes, Greg? Well, except it can't, right? Because it's free association. So the very second that the Federation says, by the way, you're not going to be able to strangle our economy, um, if we're holding to anarchist principles, then that union has the right and the ability to unfederate with the Federation. Mm. And that's, that's just the problem with production. So. It seems that that's an insoluble, not, not merely a practical problem, that's an insoluble principle problem that seems to be essentially recreating the, the very, it, it, it's not essential, right, but of course there's plenty of people who support capitalism who say, well, it doesn't have to turn into large, faceless, multinational corporations that, you know, murder people worldwide and, and you know, strip the rainforest. But it seems that there is at least a strong, fundamental, theoretical basis for the restoration, or, or simply the, the continued functioning of capital, except capitalist is replaced with, you know, certain federations, a banking federation, or um, a, a, a very key industrial federation. Uh, more industrial, or more profitable industries yeah. not come to dominate anything else. Yeah. Um, and then the second is that there's um, a consumptive aspect, which is the the geographic area uh, distributes and everyone gets a share. This again seems to have no theoretical basis, um, which seems that it would have to go with one of two things, which is either one, it does so simply out of the goodness of people's hearts, um, which is fine, um, but just looking at world history as of right now, that doesn't seem to be a, a really good way to bet, especially since capitalists are dominating, dominating everything. But then if these consumptive uh, ge uh, syndicates are fundamentally different from the productive syndicates, then it seems you've once again recreated um, at least a theoretical distinction between those who produce and those who consume, and that also the um, syndicate which provides consumption then provides um, a reconstitution of uh, exclusionary groups, um, especially given either one, everybody gets whatever who is, it happens to be in this region, um, which begs the question, well, why not everyone in every region? Um, so you just essentially have a reassertion uh, of nationalism under the guise of a, a consumptive syndicate, or um, you have the distribution of uh, production without any um, stipulations, without any qualifications, um, in which case then it seems that the productive syndicates would simply be, become the exploited masses um, to the parasitical um, Theoretically parasitical, like everyone can be perfectly fine with it, but of course everyone can be perfectly fine with capitalism and still be exploited, but the parasitical, consumptive, regional syndicate. So how would you address that theoretical well, critique? Th there, there's not a difference between the two, because say you have, like you work at like Michael's, for example. So your particular union at Michael's would elect a delegate that would be part of a larger federation that would oversee you know, that particular industry making frames, apparently. So that's along industrial lines. But then your same union, consist, you know, consisting of the same workers, would also then have a delegate to the labor cartel, as the word Rocker uses for it, which would be geographically based. So, and that labor cartel would then be responsible for distributing uh, you know, production in this particular geographic area. So, from the same union, you would have delegates that would be part of that industrial um, federation and then also part of the labor cartel or this other federation that's responsible for distributing 
um, you know, what is what is produced. So there wouldn't be that separation or the gap between producers and the consumers, because clearly all of us are both, by your worker. Um, so there, it would just be that people from that same um, from that same initial union, for example, would have representation in both of these like parallel um, organizations, so to speak. Rocker refers to it as like the two poles around which like society would would function. Yeah. 